Luis Alberto Ferre, a proud graduate and a master's degree graduate from the College of Communication at Boston University. So, Luis Alberto. Well, good afternoon to everybody. You guys ready? How about the parents? Are you ready? Yeah. Big round of applause. Come on. I am so thrilled to be here with you and share my story. My story is not different from any one of you who would have been in the same position that I have been. Um, but I'm thrilled and honored um, by the school, Tom, and the faculty for having me here and being able to tell the story in the name of the people of Puerto Rico. So thank you. Here we go. Well I, was a, well, I was here as a grad student in the late 80s. Hurricane Hugo um, tore through San Juan, and I remember talking to my family about it and what they saw and felt during the storm. I never imagined that almost two decades later, I would be up here sharing my own story with you, one with far greater social and economic consequences for Puerto Rico. I want to thank you for this opportunity to the school because, believe it or not, up to this point, I had no time to write my own story. I was too busy surviving, too busy helping, too busy in our own reconstruction and transformation as a people and as a society. So I hope that by sharing my story with you, I can pay tribute to my colleagues and also to the people of Puerto Rico. First, a little bit of who we are. My family has been involved in politics, arts, business, and philanthropy of the island for the last 100 years. So on the black and white, it's my, my grandparents and my great-grandparents, and the, on the color, it's my siblings. And in the middle are my parents. So I want to make sure they, they're, although they're not in the picture, I know they're there. So, and I know they're watching, so uh, three generations. We are descendants of French and Cuban immigrants who, through hard work, vision, and courage, were fortunate enough to play a role in every economic transformation in Puerto Rico in the last 100 years. Today, this day, today, 18th of May, we are celebrating the, 18th, the 48th anniversary of El Nuevo Día newspaper in Puerto Rico. So say a big hello to all my people in Puerto Rico that are watching. Happy birthday, 48 years almost half a century. But there's no doubt in my mind that as a family and as a business, we were able to survive Hurricane Irma and Maria due to our strength as a family, our sound business decisions, but most importantly because of the higher purpose inherent in our job as media executives, as journalists. That higher purpose is what has guided us in the aftermath of the hurricane as we became a shelter, a lifeline, and a beacon for all Puerto Rico. And we did so not expecting that we were going to be one of only two media outlets left standing after the hurricane. María es el segundo huracán que yo cubro como periodista. Yo cubrí George en el 98, viví y recuerdo bastante bien Hugo en el 89, pero yo no era periodista. María tuvo un efecto mucho más grande que George en Puerto Rico por varias razones. Primero, es un huracán más potente. Segundo, su impacto fue más directo sobre Puerto Rico. 
Y tercero, nos sorprendió en un momento en que nuestra infraestructura estaba mucho más débil de lo que estaba en el 98 cuando ocurrió el huracán George. A nosotros la información nos llevaba bastante a cuenta gota, prácticamente pues las comunicaciones y la electricidad estaba fuera en el país, pero siempre nos mantuvimos actualizando el minuto a minuto de Andy. Recuerdo de ese día que las primeras imágenes que llegaron, llegaron de Cataño. Teníamos un poco de prisa porque estábamos ya en hora de cierre y teníamos que hacer la edición del día siguiente, que era una edición histórica, era la, la edición del huracán. Queríamos algo que fuera de pueblo, que la gente se identificara, no ir con algo clichoso. Y nos acordamos de, de La Plena, ¿verdad? Y esa canción tan emblemática. Y entonces ahí dijimos que será de mi borinquen. En total estuvimos 44 días sin energía eléctrica que nos llevó a gastar unos 164 mil galones en todo ese periodo de tiempo. Nos sentamos a, a, a trazar un plan de cómo íbamos a distribuir nuestros periódicos, porque ese sí que fue el reto mayor. Distribuirlos en refugios, en hospitales, en puestos de gasolina que estuvieran abiertos. Periodistas, redactores, editores, todos salimos a la calle a repartir periódicos porque sabíamos que la información que teníamos podía salvar vidas. Un momento que recuerdo que fue crítico en la redacción fue cuando la represa de Oaxaca amenazaba con colapsar. Había cientos de personas, miles alrededor de ese lugar que estaban en peligro y ni siquiera el gobierno tenía forma de comunicárselos de manera inmediata. Las alertas de PrimeraHora.com se convirtieron en ese vehículo para informar a la gente que estaba en peligro. Ahí reafirmamos nuestro compromiso y que en ese momento nuestra prioridad era Puerto Rico en todas sus dimensiones, con un poco de señal que a veces entraba alguna que otra comunicación Recibo un mensaje de texto que dice, estoy en el techo. Era un mensaje del compañero Geraldo Alvarado. Y tratar de salir o buscar o, o movilizar para llegar hasta allí y, y rescatarlo. Empiezan a gritar los vecinos que había llegado rescate. Cuando por fin nos podamos montar, que nos fuimos con las mascotas y con todo, ¿sabes? No, no dejamos nada en la casa, que empezamos a ver entonces la destrucción de, de cómo realmente había quedado Puerto Rico. Eso fue otro, otro cantazo. Y... y y heavy. Ahí entra el, el shock de adrenalina de que yo decía, bueno, aquí es que está la noticia, yo tengo que ponerme a trabajar también. En ese momento yo no pensé en nada nada más que conseguir la información. Yo me engancho el, el, el ID y empecé a trabajar. Mi casa era de madera y pensé, bueno, si durante el Irma, el último huracán no pasó nada, tal vez estoy un día dos y viro el trabajo. Las cosas se pusieron fuertes y decidí junto a mi madre, que es impedida, abandonar mi hogar y no es un sitio más seguro. Creo que fue lo mejor que yo hice porque nadie se esperaba la fuerza que traía María. En cuestión de horas, ya, ya lo había perdido todo. Pablo fue el último en llegar a la redacción. Hacía una semana que no sabíamos nada de él. Me acuerdo que llegó, nos abrazamos y lo primero que me dijo fue dame algo para editar. Y eso para mí fue tan importante porque él había perdido todo, su casa, absolutamente todo, y él estaba ahí pensando en trabajar. Una vez nosotros culminamos el, la fase inicial de la emergencia, salimos a la calle en unas misiones de 48 horas, donde desplazamos eh, grupos de periodistas y fotoperiodistas a las áreas más remotas de Puerto Rico, a la zona montañosa, a los campos. Nuestros periodistas se quedaron, pernoctaron con personas damnificadas, con personas que todavía no tenían techo. En tantos años, ya que son casi 20 años de carrera, nunca pensé ver a Puerto Rico así. Muchas personas se, 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 se nos acercaban y lloraban a nuestro hombro. Veía en nosotros quizás una esperanza de que a través de, ¿verdad? de, de mi lente y de, la, y de las palabras que podía escribir mi compañera podían tener algún, quizás algún, algún rayo de luz. Si bien los daños que experimentó Puerto Rico fueron en dimensiones colosales, también así de colosal fueron las asignaciones eh, federales que se enviaron o que se prometieron. Y una de las cosas que hicimos es analizar cuánto de ese dinero asignado estaba llegando a Puerto Rico. La isla no se ha recuperado aún eh, y yo creo que Puerto Rico necesita de voces fuertes como las del Nuevo Día y Primera Hora que vamos a estar ahí en ese camino de, hacia la reconstrucción. When, when Tom talks about me leading this, art, this effort, it was his people who did it make it, really made it happen, along with the rest of the staff of, of our company. 
During the hurricane, we sheltered 150 employees and their families. The building held, but not much more outside. We had enough gas, water, and food to sustain us for a week. Our son, then an intern at the New York Times, here with me present, uh, and other mainland journalists from the AP, EFE, the Spanish uh, uh, news agency, the economists, the Miami Herald, among others, spent the first few days working out of the newsroom. Because of that, we were able to tell the story to the rest of the world. For days after the storm, families would sleep in the conference rooms and offices while we ran the operation stepping over sleeping bags and pillows. The cafeteria crew served food for one week free. We hosted small businesses in our facilities for months because they had no place to go. For the first few days and weeks, our building became a survival camp where strangers shared bathrooms, volunteers helped with kids, and small business owners shared space. It was like a bubble of life in the middle of death and chaos. It gave hope, and it was beautiful. That night, as the hurricane reached its peak, we lost contact with our teams out in the field, one by one. At that moment, the newsroom became eerily silent. Only the voice of editors trying to reach their teams pierced it. Outside, the wind was ripping everything to shreds. All we could do was wait and pray a lot. A few hours later, one by one, almost all of our teams began filing stories, videos, and pictures. They had found pockets of internet and cellular services from which they could send their work. Slowly, the picture of desolation and destruction began to appear in front of our computers. Only by filing their work did we know that they were alive and well. As the missing came back to the newsroom, applause broke, colleagues hugged. Some of them were lifted three days later. Others made it back on their own. Many came back dazed, hungry, and dirty. But they came back, and that was all that mattered. And then they got to work. After the storm passed, with tropical force winds still present, the first pressmen and distribution employees showed up. You see, there was a paper to put out. And we went out and distributed both papers for free. I went. Everybody went. Many would just snatch it from my hands, three, four, five copies at a time. Many of these people had no images, no pictures. There was no electricity, no record of what had really happened. However, our websites were informing the Puerto Rican diaspora, five million strong, who, were living, who are living here in the United States, and who were preparing their own unprecedented rescue operation. While, we were preparing, while they were preparing to help, Puerto Ricans in the US were able to reach their loved ones in the island and inform them to what was happening because they were following us. For the first four to six weeks, with no advertising, no page circulation, we put out thousands and thousands of copies of our newspapers ramping up free distribution as fast and safely as we could along routes with downed trees and power lines and landslides and debris. We only missed one day of print publication, the day the hurricane hit. When the hurricane stopped, Puerto Rico had no electricity, no water, no communications, no TV, no radio, no cable, no working cell phones, a complete and utter blackout. The governor and its team were hunkered down and incommunicado with the rest of the emergency agencies. Town majors and communities had to fend for themselves. And so they did. And the biggest story of self-rescue and survival in our history began to unfurl under our own eyes. In the end, the official death count for Maria was 64, but we know it's much higher. Maria left a terrible material cost to Puerto Rico, 
anywhere between 90 to 95 billion in damage, almost a third of that in electric, the electric grid itself. Close to 300,000 homes were damaged. Almost of them, a third of them totally devastated, gone. A quarter million Puerto Ricans have left the island since the storm. We might have just witnessed the first wave of climate change refugees in history, in US history, all of them American citizens. But the storm did not break our spirit. In the first few days after the hurricane, we told stories of people opening roads with their own hands, power tools, machetes, shovels. The elderly, the sick, the hurt, the young needed help. And so, so many of them walked for hours, carrying the love down, down the mountains, and came back with bags full of whatever supplies they could find. We told the story of volunteers, of ordinary people heading into the mountains by the hundreds on their own, risking their safety in caravans of private small cars, big cars, rickety cars, trucks, buses of all types. They brought food, water, and clothing, but they also brought hope. And they were telling people, you're not forgotten. You see, in Puerto Rico, we had our own Dunkirk, we, and we told that story. As the metropolitan area of San Juan struggled in a chaotic mess of traffic jams, enormous lines for gas and food, we sent teams of reporters and videographers with satellite phones and gear to reporting missions to the most isolated areas of the island. We needed to remind people that things were much, much worse outside the capital. Almost always, we were the first sign of outside help. Our sad phones became their lifeline to their loved ones. Desperate town mayors would tell stories live for the first time. That is how the public authorities were able to find out what was really going on outside San Juan. Our media company became a lifeline for Puerto Rico, while TV and radio were down for days. No one, the one, the one remaining radio station and us worked together in feeding information to each other as we were able to keep the public and authorities informed about the trouble spots through the island, helping to direct supplies and support. This has not been an easy time for us as a people and as a business. Thousands of jobs have been lost. Thousands of businesses have closed. Advertising and circulation revenues did not return. With the economy in shambles and after weeks and weeks of no advertising and no circulation income, our own financial survival was at stake as a company. We could not run the business like we did before the hurricane. And a few weeks later, we had to let go of many employees, some of them my own colleagues, my journalists. It was the hardest day of my life working for that company. A lot has been written about resilience in latter years in relation to catastrophic events and personal crisis. From the Latin resiliere, resilience means literally to bounce back. But is that enough? Bounce back to what? To how we were before? I recently came across a theological term, metanoia, which in Greek means beyond the mind, and it speaks about deep transformation. In the Christian tradition, metanoia eventually became more associated with repentance and atonement. I was both intrigued about the, time, about the timing of that finding and also its meaning in the context of what had just happened to me and to us. How can we not, how can we not let ourselves and our work as journalists be transformed by this event? How can we not? Can we not hear the invitation that has been put forth? It is a time of genesis, a new narrative that speaks of transformation so that we can help build a different reality, a different world from the one that was almost wiped out. 
The invitation is also to stay on the story when the story matters the most. It will be our job, your job, to help shed light upon catastrophe and disaster, upon injustice, upon the opportunism that knows no bound and is not impeded by cruelty when tragedy strikes. It is also our duty to shine a light on truth, on hope, on the mercies, the courage, and the unbreakable spirits of human beings who resiliently survive and, who, and upon those who strive to make a better world. It is our duty to record and uncover the maladies of modern society, social injustice, corruption, second-class citizenship, poverty, inequality, and discrimination. It is our duty to highlight the struggles to help remedy those maladies. But it's also our duty to always stay on the story and to never, never, ever give up. Thank you very much.